Hello and welcome to another episode of Bible Smack. Alright, um, it's been a little while since I have posted a video, and basically, um, I think what that amounts to is that, um, you know, sometimes you have to stay, take a little bit of a step back and evaluate where things are going. Um, but I've been doing a lot of research. I've been drawn to a lot of research dealing with the gospel itself and Jesus and the resurrection. So I figured I'd uh, go ahead and do like a little display of some of that. Um, it is kind of at a point now where things are kind of irritating when it comes to um, trying to get the message out because what happens is that you get you know so many levels of understanding and our society is being drained of normal you know or deep logic if anything's really that deep you know it's kind of <laughs> being drained away from society uh, typically everything has to be on a reading level well even when you you know you get on Facebook or you get on you know some internet or whatever and you're typing and stuff, there's like a lower level of communication there. And that's why, you know, people kind of, <laughs> they're into memes or symbols or whatevers and, you know, a acronyms. And they just, there's not a whole lot of, you know, deep vocabulary going on. Um, people don't want to, people don't want to get too deep into something. They want to shoot their mouth off on anything, but they don't really want to explore all the options and go through it. So, you know, here I wrote a book, and I'm starting to realize very few people, even the people who agree with me, are really want, real willing to go all the way through and read the whole book, or read even half the book. So, that's frustrating because society can't really be affected if it's not really getting deep. It can't grow, it can't change, it's just a blob. And the blob just gets herded and scooped up to one side or the other. It's not really, um, you know, having any stability. So I think that's probably the biggest problem right now. We have more evidence out there than ever before. Uh, the problem is that we don't have a will to listen. We have been desensitized and we have been... Um, doped up, I guess you could say. Um, not only in drugs, but in um, media and behaviors that fashion to that. So, as I'm kind of given this, um, I'm a little bit heavy-hearted about that idea, you know. Um, yeah, it's just discouraging, but nevertheless, you know, you just got to keep pushing. You know, sometimes you feel like you're not making a difference. But you just got to keep pushing, you know. You never give up. Um, I got that award in high school um, on the, when I was a wrestler. They uh, had me facing guys, and I was 190 pounds, and they were having me face guys that were like 270, 280 pounds. And I was a freshman, so I wasn't really that muscular. I wasn't <laughs> really hitting the weights hard enough or long enough to really be able to make a dent on any of these seniors who are like, you know, six foot five and, you know, 270, 80 pounds. So basically I had to go through one day where we had a special tournament and I wrestled about uh, six matches that tournament. And the last match I faced a kid who, uh, they let him weigh in extra heavy that day. Okay, they were very lenient to him. So he originally weighed in at 286 pounds and then he uh, lost some weight so that he could get in there again and um, qualify. So basically, um, I took him and I beat him. And um, my coaches were impressed, and so they gave me this thing called the Never Quit Award. And recently, I was talking to a fellow teammate a um, little time out, and I just told him how I'm just getting frustrated with life. And he just told me, he said, you know, I know how it is. You keep pushing. And, you know, very... You know, very simple words, not really <laughs> trying to be a poet laureate or anything like that. But it's just, 
you know, when you know somebody and you've been there and you had the experience and stuff, it means a lot. And um, that's what we have to do, you know, just keep on pushing forth, you know. So when I deal with the gospel, um, I am going to be doing this. Uh, I've got some notes, but honestly, I'm just going to get super boring if I just talk about the notes. So, obviously, I'm not going to get every ounce of research in there. I'm not going to necessarily be perfect as I give this presentation. And I also know that, um, you know, in Corinthians it says that knowledge puffeth up. So, basically, um, I know that the wrong heart is just not going to receive this message. But this is the message. You know, um, I was giving a presentation on a, another theory, and I guess I can put this one in there. Um, basically, uh, it talks about the zodiac signs, and when we look at the zodiac signs, um, there is a gospel presentation in the constellations. And the uh, Bible says that God has his throne over the north, and it says that... Um, you know, you had uh, Lucifer originally there, and Draco was originally over the north, and that constellation got shoved over, and then uh, Ursa Minor came over there. Well, Ursa Minor is typically understood in Greek as a little bear, but it doesn't make a lot of sense because it's got a giant tail. But if you translate that in Arabic, I think it was a Rukaba, um, you translate in Arabic, it means the little sheep. What is a little sheep? It's a little lamb. And so basically um, now the throne of God, the temple of God, you know, you have to go through the priesthood of the little lamb. Okay. And um, yet it's also connected to the pole star, the north star. And the sailors, whenever they got lost, would look to the north star. And so um, I would say look to the lamb whenever you're lost. You know, you can go outside on a clear night and you see the stars and you'll know that that little dipper is actually the lamb and that you can look at the lamb whenever you feel like you're lost and you can find your way home. So with that, um, you know, we'll talk about the gospel. Now, I believe that once these things are all put together, and as I said, I'm not going to get everything together with this stuff uh, tonight. But when these things are all interweaved, it's like a quilt and it becomes impenetrable. But these are all very simple, very little facts that are here and there. And they just don't, you know, seem to be a big deal until they all start getting internetted. And so uh, the first place that we go to is we have to deal with the fact that there are groups of people now who are conspiracy theorists. And they have a Jesus mythicism conspiracy. They believe that Jesus never existed and that he was a myth and I believe there are ulterior motives to this but what they do is you know they say there were no contemporary secular sources Did this just you know happen later well we have many secular sources that talk about Jesus during that day uh, Tacitus um, Celsus uh, let me see if I can Look at a couple of these real quick. Uh, Thales and um, the Talmud. And uh, let's see here. And then um, a couple others. Uh, Africanus. So we have these sources, but they would argue hey, those are all written later, and so they were affected by the story. And so with that, you don't really have any contemporary witnesses. It's okay. Well, actually, um, number one, there's a couple explanations. Okay. In 70 AD, the temple got destroyed, and that's where you keep the temple records. So the local records of Jesus were burnt up in the destruction of the temple. Um, I don't know about other records, but those are easy to wear away too. 
You'd say, well, then how do the Jews have any history if their local records got destroyed? Well, we still have the Talmud, and we still have the works of Josephus, and a couple of other groups. Uh, and, of course, there are everybody else's you know, version of the story, too. So we do have Jewish record. We just don't have anything at that time because it was burnt up. But there are other contemporaries. Now, they would list a bunch of contemporaries and say, you see, these people never mention them. But most of the time, those are contemporaries that are not quite in Jerusalem, not quite in Judea, not quite in Palestine. Um, and they're not quite talking about religion. They're not quite talking about Jesus. They're not quite talking about the Roman Empire. They are off on totally different tangents. And there are plenty of people around the country, okay, my name and my voice have been out nationwide, I've been out across the internet, most people still wouldn't know anything about me, okay, and you'd say, well, why weren't you in this or that? Well, it's because you missed the one in 10,000 newspapers that you could read <laughs> that would have had me there, okay, you didn't listen to the radio that one day out of like, you know, 500 days that I was, you know, around a radio. Um, so there, there's a lot that any contemporary uh, can totally miss. But uh, there is something that's interesting that I think that mainstream scholarship does not grasp. Um, there's a song. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Uh, in England, it's one of the most popular of the patriotic tunes. And it goes like this. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountain green? And was the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pasture seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among those dark satanic mills? And I'll cut short there. That was a um, song by William Blake in the 1800s. Uh, one of the most uh, prolific poets of his age. And this became one of the most popular tunes still today. They'll play it in soccer stadiums, for instance. Um, and what's it talking about? You know, he's like, well, did the Lamb of God walk here? Was a Jerusalem built here? What is he talking about? Well, this is something that you can see in the legends of the Knights of King Arthur. And basically, the stories go that um, Joseph of Arimathea came to England, that Joseph of Arimathea even brought his nephew. Who was his nephew? Well, according to these legends, it was Jesus himself that came here as a young man. And basically, um, he came, and then after um, he went through his ministry as a full-grown man and left the earth, Joseph of Arimathea would come back and uh, settle um, the estates. Now, uh, this would also have him as, you know, Jesus' great uncle. And it would also have him as a tin man, a person who mined tin. Um, Joseph Arimathea is supposed to be a rich man in the Gospels. And even in the prophets, there's a prophecy that says that Jesus would be buried with the rich. Um, so what's going on? On one hand, when Britain is making a deal about these stories, Joseph Arimathea is not the biggest character in the Bible. You can miss him fairly easily. I don't think I even was fully aware of who he was until like my late teens to early 20s after being a Christian since I was seven, okay? Um, it wasn't really that big a part of the gospel. It does have an important part of the gospel, okay? 
because it was with Joseph of Arimathea that Jesus had been laid in a tomb, that it was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, and it was Joseph of Arimathea who took him off the cross. And yes, that's very important, but as far as generally, when we celebrate our holidays and we think about the apostles, we, he's not like the biggest character on our minds. So why is it that this Western nation all of a sudden has all this stuff to say about this great Joseph of Arimathea? Well, some of these things, they sound wild and sensational, but they are literally not. In other words, there's no necessary miracle to these accounts of Joseph of Arimathea. What do we have? Well, the um, Knights of King Arthur and the legends that were written at a time, um, dealing with uh, the Welsh and dealing with Glastonbury, England, and all that kind of stuff. And this was written uh, at a time where they did have historical records in Glastonbury. And most of your fictional novels will have fact mixed in. They'll have these historical novels and the facts will be mixed in. And we see that even like with Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. We see uh, some true facts and places and stuff mixed into legends. The most legendary thing that is said of Joseph Arimathea is that he struck um, the um, dirt at Glastonbury and... Out came the Glastonbury thorn tree. Uh, but if you just assume that that's just, you know, stretching it out from a legendary tale, then all that is is that he brought forth a thorn tree. Now, this is a good time to talk about some evidence. Okay. Now, when it comes to Joseph Arimathea and stuff like that, the legends about him, uh, you have. These things that are different from what the Bible's saying, and yet they coincide. Okay, uh, Jesus, we know that um, the Gospels stop off when Jesus was about 12 years old. We know that at some point his father, Joseph, died. Uh, then you also have, um, you know, the fact that Jesus seems like a stranger when he comes in to his baptism. People think seem a little unfamiliar with him, even though they're supposedly cousins. You know, many of his cousins were present when he was baptized. So why all of a sudden do you have, um, you know, this absence? Well, if he had went with Joseph and Matthea over to England, that would explain it. But you'd say, well, what would he be doing there? Okay, well, basically, as I did my research, you find out that the um, Europe and Asia, uh, the, the place in Europe and Asia to go and get the mineral tin would be in Glastonbury, England. They would not have called it that. They would have called it Tarsus. Okay, Tarsus was England, the coast of France, and Spain. So they would go and uh, mine tin out there. And this was an arrangement that had been going on for centuries. The uh, King Solomon actually purchased tin from Tarshish. And how would he get that? Well, uh, they would go up north, which is not far north, but they would go to their neighbor. And they would go to the neighbor, the city of Tyre. And it was in the t city of Tyre that they would go and sail all over the place. And Tyre was a major shipping port. And so uh, many Jews would do business in England, also known as Tarsus, or Tarshish. And they would bring back the tin, and they'd pay them a lot of money and all that kind of stuff. So they had a good working relationship. We know that Joseph Arimathea was a rich man. That's a way to become rich. We also know that uh, Joseph Arimathea acquired the body of Christ. Legally, when you have a dead person, it is the family who acquires the body. Joseph Arimathea, when we see him in the Gospels, is always around the women. And the women who were related to Jesus, like Mary. So, could it be that he's with family? And so he was part of Jesus' family. Um, some of these things, they, they just coincide together. So, when we look over, how do we know that he was over there? Well, 
we have uh, some different records, uh, like the uh, I think it was the Dooms Laws under uh, King um, Alfred the Great. And in the Dooms Laws, it talks about how uh, there was uh, in Glastonbury, there's 12 hides of land that were uh, donated to a group of refugees. And uh, that's what he would have been, is he would have been a refugee. And they were never to be taxed. So it was a donation. Why would he give this guy a donation? Well, because he's a business partner who's worked with them many years. Okay, so King Argaragas gives this 12 hides of land. And over there, they have this Glastonbury thorn tree. The Glastonbury thorn tree, um, that particular one, got cut down. But it has um, had been apparent to many other Glastonbury thorn trees. It is not related to any of the other trees in all of England. They found that the only um, relatives that this Glastonbury thorn tree had were in Palestine, which of course we also call Israel. All right. So um, it was northern. It was they'd say Syria, Palestine. So northern Israel. Okay. So basically, you have this Israeli element. In the stories, it says that he sailed to Glastonbury. Glastonbury was an island in the first century, but at the time that um, the legends are recorded down um, with King Alfred and all them, that was about a thousand years later in the Dark Ages where um, they just would not be aware that uh, the island was drained out. So nobody then would know that you can sail to Glastonbury because at the time that they wrote it, nobody was sailing to Glastonbury. It was all land. Okay. Uh, there were no dams to keep the water away. So, um, yeah, basically they had a, a piece of information from that first century period. And we also know, as I said, of King Agaragas. We also know that um, there is an ancient Christian church that... Um, goes all the way back to that time period and we don't know exactly when it started but there is this ancient church unconnected with the Roman Catholic, um, Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church started around 600 in terms of um, the Catholic Church in England and so that was started by Augustine of Canterbury back around 600 AD. Uh, so you had um, those legends. You also had tales from France of Joseph of Arimathea going through that area. Now, there are critics who go with the Jesus mythicism theory, and they will go so far as to say, well, Joseph of Arimathea was not a real person. Well, basically, when you go and study Joseph of Arimathea, uh, Arimathea is probably a Greekism, okay, in other words, it's kind of like the different languages altered it just a little bit. And it's probably coming from, I believe it was First Kings, but as I said, I'm going off of my top of my head. My research has it better. But basically, um, it was called Ramathia. Okay. And Ramathia was a mountain in Ephraim. Ephraim is the sun. All right. Ephraim is a, um, it's a county and it's also a tribe of Israel and it descends from Ephraim who was the son of Joseph okay so um, that's the Joseph in the book of Genesis okay so then a person being named Joseph from Ephraim makes a lot of sense okay and basically Ramathia him being from that territory there's a lot of personality characteristics too you know because Joseph in the book of Genesis was one who was a little bit liberal compared to his family and one who had success in the world of the Gentiles and, you know, kind of moved away. Okay. Now you have Joseph of Arimathea kind of following in his ancestors footsteps, only instead of going to Egypt, he goes off farther to Tarshish. So basically, um, you have these things connect together. One possibility, uh, because we also know there's the legends of the Holy Grail. One possibility that I don't side with but it's worth mentioning is could it be that when Jesus had the Lord's Supper at a rich man's house could that have been Joseph Arimathea being the rich man because Joseph Arimathea mentioned in the book of Acts is a secret disciple okay he was not following Christ in public he was doing so secretly 
So, when he's doing that, could it be that maybe he was there for the Lord's Supper, and maybe that's where he got the grail? But, um, as I'll discuss in a little bit, there's a little bit um, there to where I, I'm not sure if the grail was something literal, because what we're dealing with is we're dealing with a... Um, you know, a Gentile, semi-pagan nation with semi-pagan records that are, you know, not always literate. You know, some of these are through stories and tales that people would pass down as oral tradition. Okay. Um, the traditions were very strong in Britain. You have um, ancient stones that have a Jewish boy. And it's the, the type of tunic he was wearing would indicate that he was a Jewish boy with his arms open, and they would have those on burial stones. You would have um, carvings in buildings of like a ship with um, an old man and a boy, and the boy was, you know, supposed to be Jesus, and that was Joseph Arimathea. Um, oh, lots of old sayings and stuff uh, going back to this legend. Okay, this is a very strong. Uh, tradition and legend of the people that obviously carried a lot of weight and so with these carrying a lot of weight you think that well maybe there's a reason that's carrying this weight so if there's any truth to these okay oh and by the way um, there's mention of Joseph Arimathea having ancestors in England uh, so he's got a genealogy later on and there's also um, a claimed coffin. Okay, there is a, not simply coffin, there's a gravestone. Okay, <laughs> there's a Joseph Arimathy gravestone. So basically, um, you have all those, you know, pointers to this is a literal guy. But if that's a literal guy, and even though this seems like such a small thing, then what I'm basically doing is I'm taking my finger and I'm poking this little hole that the Jesus mythicists have tried to make. Okay. And so by poking that hole, I have held up the dam because everything else is pretty clear. So once you get to that point and you see that there are records of him outside, now we can skip forward and look at all these other alternative uh, records. Okay, The um, Talmud is going to have him um, in a very mocking way. But yet, they, they think that he's a warlock. What does that mean? That means that he's some sort of spiritual, supernatural guy. Okay? They never say that he's not real. They say bad things. They say that his mama was a whore. All this kind of stuff. But they don't say that he didn't exist. And that's very important because they have Jewish records. They could have, you know, if that's what was going on, they should have ran with that sucker, and they would have known. They could have known that they don't like the whole movement. They kill all these people for believing the movement. Wouldn't have been so much simpler to say, the guy never existed. Okay. So, you deal with that. Then you have um, the cosmic issues. Um, the wise men came, and they were you know, seeking things. They said they came from the east. Well, we know that the Chinese have re have recorded a supernova about that time. Now, there's a lot of weird things that happened in that time period. There's another one where there was a planetary alignment. And I'm just going to go ahead and guess that it was probably that the Chinese were right. They probably just didn't totally describe it perfectly because, number one, um, how would they know? Okay, what it exactly was. So they label a supernova. Number two, they're at a different angle, you know, and being a slightly different part of the world, seeing this go down. So basically, uh, their observation may have been at a level to where they couldn't see exactly the way the star moved and stuff like that. But nevertheless, you have this star of Bethlehem, okay, and you have a recording at the time of Jesus' birth. Then you have these other guys, and I think it was, um, oh, I think it was Thaley. Um, and basically what's going on there is that he is arguing. Uh, he does not believe in Jesus or the resurrection or anything like that. But when the, the um, sun became black, 
he's like, well, there's got to be a natural explanation to that. So he says, well, what happened was an eclipse. And he's like, well, the problem is that the Jewish calendar has it at a time where you cannot have an eclipse. Okay, it's not in the right rotation. So basically, they're admitting that, hey, the sky went black at the time. Okay. Um, then you, so you have him, you know, people are talking about him as supernatural. Uh, Origin debated a uh, pagan named Celsus, or actually maybe a heathen. You know, he's more of a philosopher, not a witch doctor, but he's a philosopher named uh, Celsus, and he debated him. And basically, um, Celsus also made the same accusation that he's a warlock. So he's a supernatural figure. Okay. Um, and then you have um, Tacitus and um, Pliny the Elder. You know, these guys putting him also in this mocking tone, but admitting that, you know... Um, the Christians believe in him, that he was a real man who got crucified, and that, like, they believe that he is God, okay, that he is divine, right from the start, instead of having all this time for a myth to develop. So, at this point, what we've constructed is a case that Jesus literally existed, okay? Um, once you have that, then you start to see other things throughout Bible prophecy taking place, okay? Um, like, for instance, um, let's see here, Psalm 16, 9. Getting there. Okay. For this is ten, sorry, Psalm sixteen ten. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one, holy one being the Messiah, to see corruption. Okay, so you know you're going through death, but that's you know, you're not gonna leave the Messiah in hell, okay? And um, there is a very important uh, typology of that. Now, typology is a figure, but it's in the book of Jonah, and Jesus retorts about this, and I'm going to go kind of hazy on some of these Bible prophecies. I do have another video where I do say that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, so I'm going through it a lot thicker there, okay? But basically, um, when we look at Jonah, uh, Jesus told the Jews that he would give them the sign of Jonah. All right. Now, the sign of Jonah was what? Well, Jonah was swallowed up by a whale. Um, I think in the Greek it's a whale, in the Hebrew it's a fish. I believe that it would have been what we call a whale shark. Okay. And it's typically thought that you know, because it said a whale, that he must have been in a place with air pockets. But no. And I believe this is when he said my soul was in hell, I believe that he died when he was swallowed up by the fish. Okay. And so once he was swallowed up by this fish, he dies. Okay. And then he is recurgitated or vomited back onto the sea. And therefore, God performs a miracle of resurrecting Jonah. And then Jonah goes out to the city. And he gives a warning, 40 days. 40 days, and this city will be destroyed. The pagan city, very pagan. Because when I say very pagan... They would make their animals fast. Not only did they repent and that they fasted, but they had their animals fast. That's not a Jewish practice. It was their pagan mind because they still didn't understand what was going on here, okay? So what they did was they repented any way they could. And um, four days went by and Jonah, of course, was angry. Now, here's what happens. Sometimes in Bible prophecy... You have a twist or a plot twist, okay? And so um, Jesus 
after he had risen from the dead, would ascend to heaven 40 days later. All right? And, you know, so you have 40 and 40. Now, with his, the people of Israel, who really should have known better and really were sitting there, I mean, over 500 people witnessing the resurrection, they should have known better. They did not. And so as a people, they rejected Jesus Christ. And so 40 years after that, there was the destruction of the city. So basically, um, and you see this in, in Bible prophecy in different places, but um, a day can mean a year. Uh, there's these parallels. And so this is kind of like an amplification. Okay, So because Israel did not accept Jesus Christ after that 40-day period, and, and they kept in that sin as a group. Now, many did come to Christ, but overall, since they kept that sin as a group, then it's kind of like a wave, okay? That wave got small and it started amplifying itself. So by 40 years, boom, and the city was destroyed. Over a million Jews were killed, okay? Now, this gets to um, an issue with the Gospels, but um, I will say that... Um, a good passage that I always like to bring up about these prophecies. You know, I'm cutting the prophecies a little short here, and I hate to do that. But anyhow, um, let's see here. It says um, in Zechariah chapter 12, it says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him. Now, this is something for the future, that Israel is going to eventually be redeemed, okay, because of God's undying love. And so he will take that nation, and take that group here on the earth, and eventually redeem it. And that will happen during the time of great tribulation, okay. And it will be a tribulation for Jacob, okay, that's what this is about. But it will bring them to repentance. And so at that point, it says, that, and this is the Old Testament, it's not New Testament. It says, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Who's me? That's the Messiah. Who's pierced? That's Jesus Christ was pierced. Remember, he got nail-scarred hands. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And so there it was, prophesied very directly. Um, now when we get to this, okay, and we discuss the Bible prophecies, there are um, hundreds of Bible prophecies. There's um, ones that talk about Jesus being born of Abraham, being born of David, being born in Bethlehem, um, many others being born of a virgin and stuff like that. So once we get through that prophecy part, okay, and we get that blocked down, we go back to this idea of the Gospels. Now we know that the substance of the Gospels is what it is. Why? Because we have 6,000 manuscripts in Greek, and the structure overall is the same, okay? You have the same storyline. There are manuscript differences that I don't like, and I'll be the first to admit they're there and I don't like. But when you come to the overall, okay, over 99% of the manuscripts are in the exact same family, and they're going with this one gospel, okay? Um, when they talk about differences, it's usually very piddly, stupid stuff. Like, you know, oh, well, the sentence was different, or the grammar was off. Ooh, there's a period and a comma, you know. And then we're talking, that's talking about the handwritten ones. But I believe... You know, once you get to this idea of believing in supernatural power of God, then I believe that there was a manuscript that was perfected over time, and that went through what we call the Textus Septus. However, we don't have to go all the way there yet. Basically, um, you have this in like over a dozen different languages. So even if you have alternatives, you can still see the same story. And the same big deal, and we're talking, you know, over 99%, you know, the same big deal is still being carried through in all the issues, okay, in different languages, 
Okay, so you don't just have it all being, you know, copied. You also have it being put in different words, in different languages, and it's all kind of coming forth the same. So, you know, you, you're making sure that it's not overly this group or that group. You know, um, there were people who tried to have alternative stories. Okay, and that was in 300 AD, the New Testament Apocrypha, the Gnostic Gospels, and they were dealt with. Okay, they were spotted and they were kicked out. So you knew that there was a system that they were filtering out. Okay, any alternatives. So you basically do have the Gospels of the Gospels. But one thing that they do that has caused a lot of this trouble is the dating. Okay, what they did is they will claim that the Gospels were written uh, at least 40 years after the fact. Okay, and the reason they claim this is because Jesus had predicted the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now, I have been reading some different groups, and you're not really seeing a whole lot different than that. The only other argument for a late date, other than saying, well, Jesus prophesied it, therefore, uh, nobody prophesies, therefore, it must have been written later. That's, that's, that's their goal, okay? Um, I think that's almost, I think it's called reification. But it, it's a fallacy where you just kind of, you, you trumpet something and then you trumpet again. Um, but anyhow, the, the idea of it is that um, some of them said, well, also in Matthew, it's talking about a church. But the word church, ecclesia, just means assembly. And yes, there are assemblies in all of human history. So it wasn't really starting up at a certain point. And Jesus did have an assembly as soon as he started getting followers. Okay, so that is a totally fine word to use, even at that early a date. Okay. But uh, basically, the argument is, is that Jesus prophesied about the destruction of the temple. Now, I was reading um, in the Oxford Annotated Bible with uh, Bruce Metzger, and he admitted that, you know, maybe Mark is before the destruction of the temple. And then I was reading another one with a New Revised Standard Version, um, open something or whatever, but... Basically, I was reading a New Revised Standard Version study Bible, and they admitted that, um, you know, maybe he did make that prophecy, but he's not very specific. It's just when he gets specific later. All right. That is an anti-supernatural bias that you're just putting onto the text. You're just saying that, like, okay, I don't believe, okay, so it's got to be over here. All right, the facts have to change, okay? We're going to make the facts over here, and we're going to make this 40 years later, all right, just because we don't believe. Well, what happens if you're a believer, okay? Now, a lot of believers are being hoodwinked. They're being naive and deceived because for some reason, we think it's okay to criticize God, but we can't criticize man, okay? So when we look at this and we say, oh, okay, it must be here, here's the problem. We know that um, the scriptures are being quoted, that the Gospels are being quoted uh, by Ignatius around 100 AD and maybe also by Clement of Rome. So basically what they're doing is they're saying that this is the latest date that you could get. Okay, and they're trying to squeeze it over here as far as they could go. It's just that they can't go much farther because they know it's already been quoted. Okay. So what they're really doing is they're saying, okay, well, let's, as unbelievers, try to get it right over here. But that's the most, that is the latest you can make it. Then they go around on these debates and they say, at least it was 40 years. No, 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 no that's your claim, <laughs> all right? That's your claim and you're trying to make a claim on a claim, okay? Um, in reality... What we've done is we've looked at the text, and in the book of Acts, the book of Acts mentions the history of the apostles. And it also mentions uh, martyrdom. For instance, it mentions the stoning of Stephen. So Luke is not afraid to mention martyrs. So why did he, if he had written this back around 70, 80 AD, why didn't he mention 
the martyrdom of Paul or the martyrdom of Peter. So if he's recording history, it would be natural that this would be before that. So it would be before 60 AD. But Luke had borrowed from several sources, and we believe that he had taken accounts from Mark and Matthew. So what does that mean? It means that, well, and here's two other things. Luke is the author of the Gospel of Luke and the, and the Acts of the Apostles. So you have the Acts of the Apostles before 60, all right, and that's a good, what, 28 chapters? A good 24 chapters from Luke, okay? So you got two big writing projects, so we got to go back some years, okay? But then we also have to go back some years for Matthew and Mark. And then also Mark is judged based on textual evolution, okay? They think that Mark is the smaller text, therefore it was a primordial text that came out of the ground. But literally, they believe that if it's more primitive, it's better. If it's the grammar's off, that it's better. Okay, that makes no sense. All right. Um, so you know that doesn't make something older unless you're an evolutionist. Since I'm not an evolutionist, that's not working here. So basically, um, I look at something called history and historical observations. What does history tell us? And Asibius, it tells us that Matthew was written first, then Mark. Okay. And of course, Matthew was an apostle. Matthew was a tax collector. So he had the ability to read and write. Okay. Out of all the apostles, he was the one who was more literate. Okay. So he had the ability to write the, this account down. And you don't have this theoretical, you know, they'll go like, oh, well, there's an oral tradition, and the oral tradition was how they got the Gospels together and everything like that. Well, I'm sure that there were illiterate churches that were repeating the Gospels and stuff like that. But the people that can read and write could read and write. Matthew was able to read and write because he was a tax collector. That's what he did for a living. So he read and wrote the Gospel. Mark would then gather Peter's sermons, okay, uh, mostly from Rome and stuff like that. But basically, he would compile those sermons together into a gospel, and that was his gospel presentation. All right, it's shorter because Peter is not a literate guy. We don't know how literate Mark was. He was just learning to kind of keep up. He's a good boy, and he went to college. Okay, so basically. That's the reason why he's going to be less, um, you know, in that direction. His was more of a working man's gospel and kind of talked about these miracles and parables that would be easier to understand. Okay. So that's what you get going on there. And once you get, get that going on there, then you don't need to worry about stupid things like Q sources and all these different years and developing a tradition and stuff. And by the way, Mark has a account of a resurrection and they want to take that out okay or they have really i mean most of your bible versions you know they say oh well, the oldest and the best manuscripts <laughs> okay the stupidest most dumbest most evil most perverted most snot-nosed people that call themselves scholars you know wrote the gospels in sinaiticus and vaticanus uh, there's arguments that it's the, those are not the oldest manuscripts. Um, there's a fellow who claimed that he forged, uh, with the help of his uncle, uh, that he forged the Codex Sinaiticus. Okay, and we don't have any historical record of Sinaiticus before that. We just guessed that it was something that was um, uh, donated. I think um, it's a record. I'm trying to remember if it was Eusebius or Jerome. I'm guessing it was uh, something to do with Asibius, but basically that there are 50 Bibles donated, and they said, well, it must have been one of those Bibles. But in that text type, okay, in that very rare text type, what you have is uh, the Alexandrians, and there is a text called Codex Alexandrinus. Alexandrinus does have that, okay? And in fact, you also have a, an Alexandrian church father, uh, Athanasius, and he will quote Byzantine text. 
Um, everybody and their mama had Mark 16. I mean, everybody and their mama had Mark 16, you know, 9 through 20. Okay. And they're like, well, yeah, but it's at a fast pace. Okay. Well, let's read what you have to say about Mark. Oh, the same scholars are like, well, oh, Mark was written at a fast pace. <laughs> and here's the cow of the resurrection written at a fast pace. <laughs> hey. And that's, a, that's just a scam. Okay. It is just hoodwinking very naive people who just assume the scholars are unbiased oh. so anyhow so we we have that and we have these records now uh you could say but i still don't believe it okay um this case has been brought forth without any of those presuppositions but those presuppositions are the facts <laughs> okay it's not like you know they say, well, they advance extraordinary evidence. Well, we, we got a lot of extraordinary evidence going on here. You know, um, Tertullian, okay, one of these ancient church fathers, he's one of the early apologists, he was a lawyer, okay, and he defended the Gospels in the courts. And basically, he claimed that it was um, one of the... See, I'm going off my head here. Um... But Tertullian claimed that um, the Caesar Tiberius, I think it was Tiberius, um, that Tiberius had petitioned the Senate to make um, Jesus a god, okay, in their pantheon. And basically, um, because he was scared of what had happened with Pontius Pilate, okay, they reported this, and they're like, hey, there's something wrong here. So... They then petitioned the Senate. The Senate rejected the petition, okay? So it didn't officially happen, but it was brought up in the record, okay? And you might say, well, Tertullian made that up. But if Tertullian had made that up at that time period, they would have just killed him. They would just burn him at the stake. He had no power, you know? He can only make claims if he could back it up, okay? So they had already accepted it for him to publish that kind of stuff, or he would have been, that's it. It's over, all right? So basically, we go down to these fundamental facts, okay? Uh, what do we know about the resurrection? Obviously, I didn't mention that this was something that was predicted to happen. And Jesus had told the Pharisees that if you tear this temple down, I will build it back up again. And, you know, they knew that they were he was talking about himself because he was the temple of God. He's the body of God. Was it Hebrews 7 where it says... Um, was well, Hebrews 10 7 but um, I'll take that a little later anyhow um, you have to deal with uh, everybody admitting that Jesus has died you have to go back to the Apostle Paul admitting to other Christians telling other Christians look okay we've got 500 brethren okay some died but we got 500 brethren and by the way how did he come up with that number of 500 brethren well, Paul, this is my theory on this. Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin, and he was persecuting people and kicking people out. And so I believe that he got that from his interviews of all these different Christians. And I believe from his interviews, he had found 500 under the threat of persecution and probably the activity of persecution um, who believed that Jesus has, re has resurrected. And they didn't have to necessarily be disciples either, but they're just people who did. They're part of that that resurrection story. Uh, you have this massive, so you have like all these people seeing this, and they think, well, maybe it's a hallucination. But uh, this was documented in the case of Christ. There have been several psychologists who kind of noted this, and you can check it out. That when it comes to hallucinations, it's not a virus. Okay, so when all these people see this stuff. It's not like, oh, well, I see this, but um, now I'm going to get you to see it, you know. Um, you can have some sort of suggestion, but it will not be everybody seeing the same thing, okay. You just suggest that somebody saw something, and people will have their own imagination. They'll imagine their own picture, okay. So you cannot spread hallucination, okay. But they all saw this resurrection. They know that there was an empty tomb. Now, by the way, let me hit on this, okay? There's physical evidence for Jesus. We have what's called the Garden Tomb, and the Garden Tomb is in Jerusalem. I know there's another place that's said to be, you know, um, the resting 
place of Christ and all these Catholics join around and stuff. But I don't believe that location is accurate. In the Garden Tomb, uh, you have it next to the Skull Mountain, I believe it was Skull Hill, which, of course, Golgotha and Calvary. Calvary is the Latin form. Golgotha is Aramaic. They were probably both used, but basically it means the skull, the place of the skull. Okay, And so on you know, Calvary, that's where we see this formation of a skull. And around, you know, you go around the hill and around the mountain, and you find the place of the Garden Tomb. And in the Garden Tomb, they have sayings, they have a cistern and stuff that was ancient in the first century and stuff, so they know a rich man had made it. Um, and it says in the Gospels that Joseph Arimathea had hewn it out, he had cut out or hewn out a rock to create this, um, uh, hold on. Okay. Don't get me wrong, I'm just not even thinking. Tomb. Okay. <laughs> uh, he had cut it out. Well, he was a miner. Okay, remember, he, he's a miner, so he's able to cut it out. And so he carves it out. Um, what's interesting is that they've got a, um, there's supposed to be a great stone, a giant stone that was laid there, and they don't have it no more. But there was a giant wheel shaped object, okay, over in my Mount Nebo that's being guarded. And they measured, some people recently, they measured the wheel, and they found it was about like 15 inches, I guess it's about that much, and that was grooved, it was, the wheel could fit perfectly in a groove at the garden tomb, okay? Um, so that kind of matches that there was this great stone that couldn't be just up and rolled away. Who rolled away the stone? Now, when we go into that tomb, we find that the size of the resting place was about five foot eight, but there is a groove in there that reached out to five foot eleven. Now, what's important about that is that we have uh, what we call the Shroud of Turin. Now, I used to think it was fake. Now, I believe it's legit for several reasons. But, of course, we know about the Shroud of Turin having an image on it that we discovered in the 20th century. Okay, in the 20th century, we saw this. You can't really naturally see this. But in the 20th century, we saw a 3D image of Christ. Okay, by going deep into it with different spectroscopy or instruments like that. Um, so basically, or using technology, I just don't know if it was spectroscopy or not, but basically using special technology, they've been able to come across with this face and stuff like that. And we know that all the wounds are matching. Okay, they have argued, well, we cut out the piece on the edge and we found... Um, that it only carbon dated to the medieval period, but then they redid it, and I mean, this was all done in peer review, and they found that the outside was caught, and they got sewn up because there was a fire that had burned the shroud, and so they sewed in cotton, okay, during that time period. Meanwhile, they found another thing called the sudarium, okay, and this was the... Um, face cloth of Christ and it wraps around your whole head and what they would do is when Jesus hung on the cross they wrapped it around his whole head so that his disfigurement would not be freaking out all these women around and all that kind of stuff so then they took it to the tomb and they took that off and then they wrapped him up in the shroud okay well they found this sedarium and the sedarium they found at a earlier time Okay, they know that it's been around at least since the 4th or 5th century. But these blood stains and mucus that come from the sedarium match the wounds on the Shroud of Turin. So that brings um, those things are together. And yet also that brings down the age. Okay, so we know that this thing is very ancient. And at that point, uh, who would have the kind of technology? Okay, who would have the kind of technology to put that in the Shroud? Right. So then, um, when you look at the shroud, the shroud has about a five foot, uh, ten or eleven inches. Okay. Just like the resting place in the garden tomb, five foot ten or eleven inches. That that matches perfectly. But they'd say, well, we found it in some hole in the wall town called Leary, France. Okay. Now, why would it be there? 
Now, they've come up with a theory, and the problem is that there's a lot of claims about a lot of relics, okay? So, this was a plausible thing. They thought, well, this one knight was there, and he made a big deal about it, so he must have taken it from Turkey and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but I believe, I have a hypothesis, that it may have already been there, okay? And the reason why I believe that is because Leary was about 15 minutes away from the river, okay? Uh, the Sienny River. So, um, several miles, you know, but basically, um, it, it's not very far off from the river and Joseph Arimathea would go up and down that river and other places when he was, you know, both preaching and also when he was, um, dealing in tin. So he could have very easily dropped off the shroud to some Christians in that area. Okay. And then they find it later because who owned that shroud? Joseph Arimathea, okay? Um, I believe, could it be that the Holy Grail was, in fact, maybe the wheelbarrow that was ca carrying that Holy Grail? Or not the Holy Grail. The uh, Shroud of Turin? Okay. It's all, you know, that part is speculative. But what we now have is we have all this physical evidence surrounding that tomb. That tomb is empty. And why would somebody have a naked, bloody corpse? And who would have... Who wouldn't have noticed that, okay? Um, you see, at the end of the day, um, nobody knows. And so, basically, um, you have an empty tomb. You have people who saw it, and you have people who saw him die before that, okay? Um, that's, that's what we have. You cannot deny that they saw that, you know, that... It's not one witness. <laughs> it's about 500. And I saw him in different places and different times. And then all at once. You know, we know at least 120 saw him right at once as he lifted up to heaven. And then you have the apostles themselves. And the apostle Paul. And James. Jesus' brother. Why would he think? You know, he even had his doubts that Jesus was the Messiah. Suddenly he's on the opposite end of it. Yes, he's risen from the dead. Why would he say that? Why would he do that in a threat of persecution? Why would this convince Paul, who thought that they were all heretics? And why would this, you know, why is it the apostles would know, if this were true, that this was a total lie, and yet here they are, and, you know, Believing it's a lie and then saying, okay, well, let's die. Let's just die for this. And we're going to die poor. All right, we're going to die poor for this. It's going to be great, you know, because we're all lying. You know, and nobody cracks. None of the apostles crack on this one. So it just doesn't add up. And so, you know, when you look at all the evidence, it appears that there was a resurrection. And there appears that it could have been a resurrection. And... <laughs> You know, um, we talked about, you know, the signs in the sky and all these astrologers who were able to figure out, hey, there's a Messiah coming. Okay, it's extraordinary. Okay, they're all saying, hey, there's a Messiah coming. And then they'll tell you, oh, yeah, well, all these religions, they had a Messiah and they had all these miracles down. What was that? Oh, that's God telling us a sign. And all of them used to believe in one God. You know, in the book of Genesis, it calls God El Shaddai. Well, the Chinese used to be the Sinites, okay, who were in Canaan. And basically, the Sinites would worship the monotheistic god that they called Shangdi, Shaddai, Shangdi, okay? So this ancient Chinese monotheistic god sounds like the ancient Chinese, ancient monotheistic god. And so all of a sudden, okay, well, hold on. Now we have a design. Now it's pointing to a designer. Okay, and, you know, I'd like to throw in, like, creation evolution issues and stuff like that. It's not really that needed, but, you know, it is just a simple fact that we have a miraculous God. That this place isn't just here by accident. Okay. Then we have to go back to the fundamental question of the Gospels. Is Jesus a liar? Was he a lunatic? Or was he the Lord? If he was a liar, 
he would not be a good person. He would be an evil person. And why do we know he'd be an evil person? Because he says something to make people get themselves killed by the millions. If he was lying, he got all those people who would die. He was a diabolical sick freak. But yet, this is not really a mainstream position in atheism or Judaism. So, oh yeah, well, he was a good man. You know, people would look up to Jesus and they'd stop, you know, um, drug addictions. They'd look up to Jesus and they'd stop being tyrants and they'd be nice to people. Uh, you think of Martin Luther King. Heck, even Gandhi admitted that he took lessons from the Gospels to have a approach to uh, pacifism, that he was promoting peace based off the work of Christ. So, you know, all these great respected figures do all these good things for people and all these charities and helping out and all of this by the teachings of Christ. And so you say, well, you know, I don't think he was a liar and an evil diabolical this or that. Well, what else was he? Well, maybe instead, maybe he was just a lunatic. And yet... If he was a lunatic, he was very intelligent for a lunatic. Think about the way he handled the situation with the scribes and talked about the Messiah and all these different things when he's only 12 years old. Think about all the lessons that he was able to make and think about the temptations that he was able to overcome. You know, is a lunatic somebody who can... You know, take persecution and still give back an answer. You know, as they're beating Jesus and pounding Jesus, he's still able to get up and say, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. He's able to converse with Pontius Pilate, say, my kingdom is not of this world. It, it, it just seems that, you know, if you're a lunatic, you would have less control. But if he's not a lunatic... And he's not a liar. Then he's the Lord. If you have all this stuff taking place and all these signs, both on the cosmic scale and through the prophecies of the Bible, and everyone, you know, confessing that this is, you know, a real person who made these claims. And yet, at the same time, you have to deal with this fact of everything changed. You know, you had the cowardly apostles saying, that's it, we're going to die and we're going to make this thing go, okay? For nothing. No, no money. <laughs> um, is there a reason for it? And the issue is, is not... Imagining the facts are true. The issue is trusting him and his blood to atone for your sins. You might have been training your whole life to escape condemnation. You have guilt. You have that guilt that's been chasing you all your life. You just try to point the finger and run, point the finger and run, point the finger and run. Just hoping one day you don't get caught. You may have been hounding you and hunting you. And yet, what you don't understand is that the faith is to understand, number one, yes, you are a sinner. And number two, yes, he is a savior. Say, so, no, he can't save me. I've fallen too far. I've got problems. You don't know my problems. I'll tell you this. I'll be honest with you. I got problems too. And I look at my back in my life and I know... Where I wanted to go 
and I know sometimes I even struggle with the doubts that I never really struggled with. But the faith that is this evidence, this certainty without any background to it. Faith is not simply the religious dogmas and the religious facts. Faith is trusting that that God and that Savior loves you and has forgiven you. And that going back on that, if you are not a religious person, it doesn't matter, he still loves you. If you are a religious person, he's forgiven you. No more. No more trying to establish your own righteousness. No more being in your own burial shroud. I wish, I wish this so much. I wish that I could be able to save people. I wish that I could be able to make a difference and make a change. I know that God can, and I know that Christ can, and I know that Christ can use me. But I have to claim that on faith because I know that I am tainted. I know that I am a sinner. I know that as hard as I work, I can always be off. But I know that he is faithful and just to forgive you. We're hitting a time where we're going to face judgment. So many have scoffed. So many have walked away. And the church hasn't done much better. I'm seeing people in my neighborhoods dying of drug overdoses. And I'm seeing churches that close down on Wednesdays and Sunday nights. Sometimes on Sundays too. I know that the church is not going to be the hero. And I know that the world is not just going to turn into sunshine and rainbows. But what I know is that Jesus is real. God is real. The Bible is real. And our Savior is faithful and just. And he will save you. And he will redeem you. And if you're a Christian right now, keep pushing. Get back up. It isn't over.